But we find out later that Balaam is actually a false prophet because he didn't fear God because he was loyal to God, because he wanted to honor God, but he feared God out of his own selfish reasons, his own, own self-preservation. Good morning everyone welcome back again to my channel today i am in numbers 22 thank you for joining me on my bible study journey i'd like to share some notes today about the character of balaam we learn about the character balaam who is not an israelite he is a non-israelite diviner and he is actually a sorcerer who the king of the moabs balak uses quite often so we will go into Numbers 22 if you want to have that ready and read along. I always have the screen here for you for you to follow along. Let's read together. Numbers 22. Then the people of Israel set out and camped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan at Jericho. And Balak the son of Sippor saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was in great dread of the people because they were many. Moab was overcome with fear of the people of Israel, and Moab said to the elders of Midian, This horde will now lick up all that is around us as the, lock, as the ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, the son of Sippor, who was king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor at Bethor, which is near the river in the land of the people of Ammon, to call him, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth, and they are now dwelling opposite me. Come now, curse this people for me, since they are too, men, too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination in their hand. And they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight, and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princess of Moab stayed with Balaam. And God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak the son of Sippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt, and it covers the face of the earth. Now come, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to fight against them and drive them out. God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Go to your own land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Once again Balak sent princes, more in number and more honorable than these. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak the son of Sippor, Let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will surely do you great honor, and whatever you say to me I will do. Come, curse this people for me. But Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God to do less or more. So you too, please stay here tonight, and I may know what more the Lord will say to me. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to you, rise and go with them, but only do what I tell you. So Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the princess of Moab. Now see, God said, If the men have come to you, rise and go with them. But Balaam didn't even wait for the Lord to confirm that God wanted him to go with these men from Moab. So God was very angry, angry with Balaam. Let's keep on reading. This is Numbers 22 in verse 22. But, God anger, but God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as his adversary. Now he was riding on the donkey and his two servants with them. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the donkey to turn her into the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. 
Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the left or to the right, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have made a fool of me, I wish I had a sword in my hand, for then I would kill you. And then the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not the donkey on which you have ridden all your life long to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed down and fell on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to oppose you, because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside before me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely just now I would have killed you and let her live. Then Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you stood in the road against me. Now therefore, if it is evil in your sight, I will turn back. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only the word that I tell you. So Balaam went on with the princess of Balak. So here Balaam was presumptuous. It was a presumption that he thought that God said for him maybe to go ahead with the men. So what does the word presumptuous mean? This is the word that came up as I was reading the story, that Balaam was presumptuous in not waiting for the Lord's okay and permission and packed up his donkey and went on his way. The word presumptuous is defined as failing to observe the limits of what is permitted or appropriate. And this shows disregard or disrespect by doing things we have no right to do. We're overstepping the line and we are taking liberties before we receive permission. This is exactly what Balaam did. He overstepped, he did not wait for God, and he was taking liberty of just going before God even said that he could. Now it's interesting that in the NIV, uh, initially I read this in the NIV and it said that since God had said for him to go, so in the NIV it said, That night God came to Balaam and said, Since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you. So I really didn't understand. If God had told him, Since these men have come to, t to summon you, it sounds like God had permitted Balaam to go, and Balaam did exactly what the Lord said. He got up, packed, and went. So why was the Lord angry at him? I digged in a little bit more, and try to find out what the other translations say. So sometimes when you see a contradiction, it's good to test and check other translations as well. I went to the King James, I went to the ESV, which we're reading here today. It actually doesn't say since these men have come to you, but it actually says if the men have come to call you, right? If is condition if they have come to call you. And we did not see any confirmation that they did come again to confirm, to ask um, Balaam to go with them. But Balaam, in his own presumptuousness, got up and packed and set on his way. So that was why God was really angry with Balaam. Also, what I found interesting here is how the donkey saw the angel of the Lord. So she tried to move aside, tried to avoid the angel of the Lord for fear, and she knew there was an obstruction on the path. And Balaam was angry at the donkey for being disobedient and when he was angry he struck her every time he was angry three times she disobeyed he struck her she disobeyed he struck her so in his eyes this donkey was very disobedient and that's why he was angry and struck her the irony is that it was actually Balaam who was disobedient and how much more should God be angry at Balaam for disobeying him and not waiting on him and being presumptuous to go with the men before getting God's final approval Yet God was merciful. He didn't strike Balaam down right away, right? God actually used a donkey to speak to Balaam to warn him. He sent his angel and then warned, the, warned Balaam by turning his donkey to the side and so that Balaam would not continue in, on his journey. So God was so much more merciful than Balaam was to his donkey. And thank God for that because when we are disobedient, sometimes we don't know and we need God to remind us. 
So when I read this, I was wondering, okay, so I didn't really know that much about Balaam. I didn't know the full story of what happened. But as I researched more about Balaam, about who he was, he was not an Israelite. He was a diviner or a sorcerer. So he was not part of the group that God had chosen. Now, did God speak to him? Yes, God definitely spoke to him in instances. So it seemed like he seemed loyal to God because he refused to curse God's people. He knew that the Israelites belonged to God. He knew that he would not want to curse God's people, perhaps out of fear, perhaps out of loyalty. And we find out later, actually, that he did not curse God's people more out of fear and selfish reasons, fear for his own life, more than for God's honor and for God's purposes. And we'll uh, read in a little bit about why we find that out. So when Balaam realized that it was God stopping him from continuing on his journey, he repented immediately. He said, okay, if this is not what you want, I will go back right away. So in his, his heart, he feared God. But we find out later that Balaam is actually a false prophet because he didn't fear God because he was loyal to God, because he wanted to honor God, but he feared God out of his own selfish reasons, his own, own self-preservation. He didn't want to curse the Israelites because he knew that God was with them. But we might doubt here whether he really had a relationship with God because it's not only God, the Lord God Almighty, who he depends on, but we know that he is a sorcerer, so he definitely worships other types of gods and different types of spirituality in addition to the Lord God Creator. So he wanted to repent out of fear for, for God, out of selfish reasons, because he didn't want to die and he didn't want to be punished. Now, why didn't he wait for God? If he knew that God is somebody to be feared, why did he go ahead and pack up on his journey? What other assumptions did he make to think that it was okay to just go ahead and do this before God, him, God gave him the permission? So to apply to our lives, we need to check our assumptions assumptions with God first, always. Don't be presumptuous, thinking that it's okay that this is what God wants. Ask God for a confirmation before acting. You know, the next time that our mode of transport in this story was a donkey, but in our lives, whatever that mode of transport is for us to get something done, whether it's a tool or a resource, when that mode of transport or resource glitches up like the donkeys seem to be glitching three times, maybe we should stop first. Stop what we're doing and think, God, is this what you want me to do? Are these glitches a sign from you to warn me to stop what I'm doing so I don't keep going on this path that will destroy me and dishonor you? So stop and check if there are glitches in your mode of transportation before you continue doing something. Maybe God is stopping us for a very good reason. So if you just read this story, you might think, and you stop right here, you might think that Balaam made an innocent mistake and he was, you know, trying to do his best to follow God, follow God's order, but he made a mistake and he repented. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But if you read the end, he doesn't end well. He may have gotten to this point where he knew how powerful God is, but he never really got to the point where he had a true relationship with God. Did God use him to speak? Yes, he did. But Balaam did not continue to make the most of that opportunity where God spoke to him. He did not continue to make the most of that relationship that he already started to have with God. So we find out that he actually doesn't end very well. He ended up deceiving the Israelites. He ended up seducing them into having relationship with the Moabite women and drawing them into sexual sin and idolatry. So how do we know this? In Revelation 2, so let's read this part where Jesus talks to the church of Pergamum. In verse 14, he says, But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So what did Balaam do here? He seduced Israelites, he led them into sexual immorality with the Moabite women, and then that led to idolatry and moved them away, further away from God. So in 2 Peter chapter 2, the whole chapter is about 
false teachers and false prophets. So let's read this whole chapter together about these false prophets and teachers who are slaves of corruption and lead people away in deception. But there were also false prophets among the people, as there will be false teachers among you also, who will bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, thus bringing on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their licentious ways, because of whom the way of truth be reviled. And in greediness they will exploit you with false words, whose condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but held them captive in Tartarus with chains of darkness, and handed them over to be kept for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a proclaimer of the righteousness, and seven others, when he brought a flood on the world of the ungodly, and condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction, reducing them to ashes, having appointed them as an example for those who are going to be ungodly and rescued righteous lot, worn down by the way of life of lawless persons in licentiousness. For that righteous man, as he lived among them day after day, was tormenting his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he was seeing and hearing. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the ungodly from trials and to reserve the unrighteous to be punished at the end of judgment at the day of judgment, and especially those who go after the flesh in defiling lust and who despise authority. Bold and arrogant, here we have presumptuousness, right? Being bold, disrespectful, dishonoring to God. Bold and arrogant, they do not tremble in awe as they blaspheme majestic beings, whereas angels who are greater in strength and power do not bring against them a demeaning judgment. But these persons, like irrational animals, born only with natural instincts for capture and killing, blaspheming about things they do not understand in their destruction will also be destroyed, being harmed as the wages of unrighteousness. Considering reveling in the daytime pleasure, they are stains and blemishes, carousing in their deceitful pleasures when they feast together with you, having eyes full of desire for adulterous for an adulteress and unceasing from sin, enticing unstable persons, and having hearts trained for greediness, accursed children. By leaving the straight path, they have gone astray, because they followed the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but received a rebuke for his own lawlessness, a speechless donkey speaking with a human voice, restrained the prophet's madness. These people are waterless springs and mist driven by a hurricane for whom the gloom of darkness has been reserved. For by speaking high sounding but empty words they entice with desires the flesh, with desires of the flesh, and with licent licentiousness those who are scarcely escaping from those who live in error, promising them freedom, although they themselves are slaves of depravity, for to whatever someone succumbs by this he is also enslaved. For if after they have escaped from their defilements of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they are again entangled in these things and succumb to them, the last state has become, the, become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn back from the holy commandment that had been delivered to them. The statement of the true proverb has happened to them. A dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow, after washing herself, returns to wallowing in the mud. So this is a very terrifying and heartbreaking passage. It talks of people who know of God's goodness, and God may have even used them before, just like Balamir, God had used him. But in the end, they didn't make the most of that they turned away from what God could offer them and gave themselves up to corruption of the flesh and not just themselves but they led God's people astray and the state where they ended up is actually worse than if they had never even known God before so here it's like if you knew God if you've been used by him and yet in the end you turn away from him, it's even worse than if you had never known him at all God sees you as worse and deserving of his righteous judgment because not only do you condemn yourself but you lead others astray and you become a stumbling block for God's chosen people 
So Balaam, like these false teachers and false prophets, they profited from the gospel. They profited from God's word for their own selfish needs. They did not obey God out of wanting to honor him, not out of zeal for the love of God or for the glory of the Lord, but they wanted to benefit. That's why they wanted God to use them for their own benefit. And that's not what God is pleased with. And we he we see here how how terrifying it is for a person who would use God's word for their own benefit and not for his honor, not for his glory. So pray for your pastors, pray for the teachers of the word that they would not let their hearts be led astray to use God's word and teaching God's people for their own selfish benefits and endeavors and ambitions, but really use God's word to guide God's people into his righteousness and keep them on the straight path. We want to use God's word as as guardrails for our lives, not for our lives and to help other people stay within those guardrails as well, not to use it for our own benefit or popularity or fame. And as we continue reading in Numbers 25, the Israelites have succumbed to the seduction of Moab at the prompting of Balaam. They gave in to the sexual immorality. They started worshiping Baal and God punished them by sending them a plague. And as a contrast, we see the kind of priest who is pleasing to God. We see this in Phaniah, son of Elisar, son of Aaron, the priest. He interceded for God's people. Let's read in Numbers 25, verses 11 to 13. Phaniah, son of Elisar, son of Aaron, the priest, turned away my anger from among the Israelites when he was jealous with my jealousy in their midst. And I did not destroy the Israelites with my jealousy. Therefore say, Behold, I am giving to him my covenant of peace, and it will be for him and his offspring. After him a covenant of an eternal priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement, atonement for the Israelites. So Phinehas was zealous for the glory and for the honor of God. He obeyed God, not for his own selfish ambitions. He did intercede for the Israelites out of his own selfish ambitions, but because he was zealous for the honor and glory of God. So here, let's check our hearts. Why are we honoring God? Why are we obeying God? Is it because we fear for punishment out of fear that we're where this great, amazing, fearful God would punish us? Or is it because we're obeying God because of a love for Him and because we want to see God lifted high, because we want to see God being honored and we want to see God being glorified? What is that heart motivation inside of why you obey God? You may be doing all the right things you're supposed to do. Maybe you've said to yourself, I have not sinned because I haven't done anything. I haven't been like the, these other people who sin all around me. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like the Pharisees who don't really have a relationship with Jesus. They're doing it because they think it's the right thing to do. They think that they won't be punished. They're doing it out of fear and duty and their own self-righteousness. What is your heart saying? Is your heart helping you obey God's commandment because you're fearing a repercussion? Or are you obeying because you want to honor and glorify God and because you love Jesus and because you love the Lord your God and your obedience is an overflow from that love and from that relationship that you have with Him. So check your heart. Are you obeying out of fear or guilt? Fearing punishment from God? Fearing God's wrath? If that's the case for your heart, ask God, ask the Holy Spirit to give you a new heart. A heart that is overflowing with love because it's a heart that loves the Lord your God above all things and you want to obey because you love him. Thank you for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.